Hi, everybody. I know this is a bit different than what you're accustomed to with me teaching in the uh, student center, but there's a reason. Um, right after this video, there is another video that was recorded this morning. It's the second part. And what happened was um, we started class, everything was going fine, but we were told that at 10 o'clock there was going to be a fire drill. I had a feeling that was going to mess things up. So sure enough, 10 o'clock, right where I'm teaching, the alarm goes off. We all have to leave the building. So I walked down to shut this off, knowing that that was going to interrupt things. But when I got down there, I realized that I did not push the record button to begin with. So I didn't record the whole first part of the Bible study. So I'm doing that now here at home in the evening. I got the same shirt on, so there'll be some continuity. But when you finish watching this video, which won't be really long, it really won't be long, then you need to go to the next video, which will show me in the classroom with this shirt on. Okay, that's part two, and that's only 30 minutes long. So the bottom line, I think the whole lesson's going to be shorter unless I talk too much here. But that's what's happened. So you got this first part, and then it goes right into the next part, but you have to click on it, okay? So if you're joining us the first time, I'm sorry I'm doing this. This is not how we normally do things, but it's what, what happened. So bear with me. So what we're doing today is what we did last uh, week in our first class is I thought it'd be a good idea to first start off with why study church history? Because the bottom line is, is the Christian church, modern evangelicals know nothing, <clears throat> very little, sorry, very little about the history of the church. And they're, they're thinking, well, wh why bother? You know, Jesus and St. Paul, and now here we are today. But see, we're missing so much, so much of what happened in the last 2,000 years um, that it's... Well, that's why I gave the reasons. And so I'm going to share with you right now the first four reasons as a review. This is what I did this morning, but I'm going to do it very quickly. Not going to go into detail. Just got to kind of read it to you and say a few things about it. And then we'll get into the last last point for this part, because all I covered was point five. And then the next tape starts with the next video, whatever starts with point six and point seven, and then we go into the apostolic church about the disciples or the early church. What does church mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you'll find that very interesting. I was planning on covering, uh, talking about the disciples. What happened to the disciples after Pentecost and after the book of Acts? Where did they go? What did they do? How did they die? And there's theories, there's traditions, there's some historical facts. So what I'm going to share with you next week is is a lot of it's speculation, but it's very fascinating anyway. So uh, without any further ado, let, let me just quickly go. Oh, let's, let's pray. I'm sorry. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. It is the day that you've made. So we will rejoice and be glad. And even though I messed up in the recording, I pray that would not interfere with um, everyone listening and learning. And I pray, folks, that, uh, Lord, that after the folks listen to this, um, hopefully brief first part, that they'll go right to the second part, Father, and uh, be encouraged by that. So bless your people. Take care of us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the first four reasons, and I have them written over here, so I'm going to glance at it. The first reason why we should study first church history is because it serves as a model for imitation. We read in Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2, talks about that we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, which is referring to the past, the Old Testament saints. And we get the, and the, for the, as they're basically watching us run this, you know, this race and uh, this Christian, you know, walk, Christian race, as Paul often says. So we get this image of all the old saints are looking down and watching us all. And, and and that may be true. I think they have a lot better things to do in glory than, you know, watch us, watch watch me. But I think what that is telling us is that we need to look at them as this great cloud of witnesses, witnesses for the gospel of the Old Testament faith and learn from them. Well, why can't that be true also for the last 2,000 years that we look back 
at the at the leaders of of the theologians of the regular people who came to faith and fought and died for sound doctrines died for the faith you know we can learn from that that we can imitate and i don't mean imitate like you're impersonating someone but we're we're called to paul says uh, follow me after i follow christ that we're to be imitators of christ that we're to live a christian life so one of the reasons to study church history so we can learn about these folks and be able to imitate them. Point number two. I already told you more than I planned on. Point number two. Studying church history is about being with the community of faith. This is, this is beautiful. Is that when you look at your heritage, if you go uh, on the Ancestry.com or as Becky and I did, MyHeritage.org or whatever it was, uh, you, you take they take some DNA and they can give you a, you know a history or you can delve into the archives to find out who your great 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 you know grandmother was and that's all very fascinating we get excited about that oh wow you know they lived in Stockholm Sweden and she was a you know whatever we get excited about that we hopefully learn from that but we are related because Christ is lives within us all that we're Christ children, we're God's children, that we're related to each other, but we're related to the late R.C. Sproul and Billy Graham and jump back a whole bunch of years to John Wesley, to John Calvin, to Martin Luther, go back even further to, you know, Irenaeus and Polycarp, you know, and the Apostle John, the Apostle Paul and Jesus himself. We're, we're all family. And so why would we not want to learn about our family and what they went through that we can be encouraged by that? That this God has got a great plan, which goes on to the next point. Church history is the continued story of God working in and through his people. That from Genesis to Revelation, all the way till the time Jesus comes back, it's one long story. And I say long story, it's one beautiful story. There's a scarlet thread as uh, I think the old book had talked about, the scarlet thread, meaning the, the blood of Christ that runs all the way through history, that God knows what he's doing there, which will be another point that I'll say in the second tape. So that's a quick one there. Um, and the last point that we looked at last time for is to develop humility. And my, my point in saying that was that uh, there's a tendency in any generation, but in, in this current one, the 21st century church, to look at ourselves and say, whoa, look at us. Look how great we are. We got big churches. We're, we're, we have movie stars and rock stars that are Christians. And, oh, man, we're, we're doing so, you know, great. And we get ourselves rather proud about, look how cool we are as Christians. And if we stop and think about what the saints of old in the last 2,000 years went through, as we're going to talk in the next few weeks about the persecution they faced, the horrible things. You know, I'll talk next week about some of the ideas of where the disciples went. And one pretty positive one is that Thomas went to India, preached in India and established a whole Christian community there where the story goes that he was martyred by having, by four soldiers stabbing them with their with their spears, you know, with the stuff they went through. When we talked about Blandina, you know, last week, the, the servant girl in um, AD, I think it was 177, I think it was, that the horrible things that she went through and the other Christians in Leon, Gaul, or modern day France, that they went through for their faith, it, it's got to humble us to say, wow, who am I? What do I think I am? I'm so holy. No, man, these people lived it and they died because of it, Lord. So it really keeps us humble. That's why we should study church history. The fifth reason, and a very important reason, and actually I had 20 reasons, but I wanted to cut this all, all down. But the fifth reason that we want to look at right now is a very important reason. And this fifth reason is to keep us from error. Not knowing about the many errors in the history of the church dooms us to repeat those failures again. Well, what is the, the old expression? We don't learn, learn from history. We are, you know, destined to repeat, you know, those mistakes. I'm not saying it exactly right. But many of the heresies of the first few centuries of the church have surfaced once again in our times and have for the last 2,000 years. 
but knowledge of these early heresies will help us remain in the clear path of biblical truth. There is nothing as, as Koheleth, some say Solomon, but Koheleth, the teacher in Ecclesiastes, that he said, there is really nothing new under the sun. Every heresy and strange teaching that we see servicing today in the church has already manifested itself in some form or another during the past 2,000 years. Studying church history helps us to stop false teaching in its tracks. For instance, if your pastor, and I say your pastor because uh, a lot of us who were in class are from uh, countryside, but there's plenty listening who, who aren't. So let's just, for instance, say if your pastor, but our pastor would never do this, but if your pastor begins to teach that Jesus is inferior to the Father or of a different substance than the Father, and if you're, you know, and you think of wondering about that, but if you're really familiar with church history, you won't believe it for a second. Or related, if you're if you're listening to a Jehovah Witness who tells you that Jesus isn't God but is a created being, then if you know your history, you will know that's the heresy of Arianism, the teaching that um, Jesus was a created being, and that was soundly defeated back in the third and fourth, you know, century. But sure, it makes its way up again. You get sucked right into it. I mean, that reminds me of. Uh, with the Jehovah Witnesses, is that if you ever talk to a Jehovah Witness, either they were born and raised a Jehovah Witness, so they don't know any better, or they've come from a mainline denominational church. I've heard them say it, I've asked them. You will rarely, if ever, find a Jehovah Witness who at one time was active, active in a Southern Baptist church or in a... Uh, a Reformed PCA or a Reformed Baptist church, you know, or a healthy Pentecostal church that uh, really preached the word. And the reason you don't find them in the Jehovah Witnesses is because they've been taught the word and they know the word for the most part. But the people you find who are part of the Jehovah Witnesses are people who were in mainline churches who have not, I'm not going to name denominations, but we're not taught the gospel clearly. We're not taught sound doctrine. We're not taught their Bible. So a Jehovah Witness comes to the door and says, uh, oh, uh, do you go to church? Oh, yes, I do. I'm a, I'm a believer. You know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Oh, that's great. Hey, let me ask you a question. Um, you believe in the Trinity? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, are God? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, could you show me in your Bible? Go get your Bible and show me in your Bible where the word Trinity is found. Oh, uh, well, I'm not quite sure where my Bible is right now, but I'm, I'm sure it's in there. Sir, no, Trinity's not mentioned in the Bible. And, and that's just a man-made, you know, doctrine. Um, you know, do you believe in a three-headed God? Is that what you believe in? You know, and see, they start talking like that, and you go, well, I, if you don't know, if you're coming from that mainline denomination and aren't acquainted with Scripture or good sound doctrine, you can say, well, I, mm, gee, tell me more. You know, and you get sucked right into it because you don't know the truth. So that's why it's important that we understand the essentials. Is that, you know, it's important for us to stop and think and go, what is really important about my faith. Understanding and articulating what is most important to Christianity is one of the crucial tasks that theology performs. This task developed from a historical viewpoint. Great people have gone before us who've studied these questions when heresies crept up. It asked the question, what has always been crucially important to Christians in each stage of church history? Because over the century, Christian theologians have developed, um, you know, their, their biblical truth of what is important, what is essential for us. And, and the, this word dogma, you might think, oh, dogma, that's not like a Roman Catholic thing. No, dogma simply means is what is deemed to be essential to the gospel. And rejecting it, rejecting dogma, these things, would entail um, apostasy you know, or heresy. Apostasy? I think that's how you say the word. 
anyway, or, or heresy. In other words, doctrines are developed with a particular church or a denomination to help guide that group in their, in their belief. And so it's important to understand what is crucial, what is important. You know, it, it tells the story how the church came to understand that God is three in one which is the received truth of the Trinity, or how they came to understand that Jesus was both human and divine, which is the received truth of the person of, of Christ. And examining these things, you begin to see what is most essential and what's less you know, important. For most of our history, and I'm talking 2000 history, the church has maintained a rule of faith. This means that we have already settled on the major doctrines of the faith, whether it be the Trinity, the divine inspiration of Scripture, original sin, the incarnation of Christ, God becoming man, the atoning sacrifice of Christ that he paid for our sins, and, and the resurrection, and the life, the salvation that comes by grace alone. Those are fundamentals. Those are fundamentals that we see in the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasius Creed, the Westminster and Belgic Confessions of Faith, and they helpfully summarize the, ch the church's rule of faith, you know, for us. Because if you don't know these, you know, uh, the basics that have been already settled, you're going to be swayed left and right, which reminds me, hopefully it's, it's right here. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, be with you in a second. But I mentioned this in the first class, and now I can actually show you some evidence, you know, or, or who I'm exactly talking about. Uh, I'm looking for a CD, you know, over there. Actually, what did I do with the, his latest one that I just got, you know, recently? There's a, um, I enjoy what's called progressive music. I don't want to bore you with this stuff, but progressive music, for those of you that live back in the, listen to music back in the 70s, would be bands like Yes!, and Genesis and King Crimson and Emerson Lake and Palmer, where they would do long 20 minute songs that told a story and the, a, a recurring melody kept springing up every, you know, nine minutes or something and a, a cool instrumentation, whatever. And so there's still modern progressive music going around. Well, one of my favorite bands was a band called Spock's Beard. And Spock's Beard comes from season two. Um, I forget the name of the episode, but it's the bizarro world, as we see in Seinfeld, where everything's the opposite. So Spock, in the bizarro world, there has a, a beard. So the band called themselves Spock's Beard. And the leader of that band is a fellow named Neil Morse. And pretty successful progressive band. Very beautiful stuff that they would, would do. When Neil comes to faith as a Christian and decides after their last album, which was very, very spiritual, that he was gonna go a separate way and just be involved in more spiritual Christian music, not a contemporary Christian artist, because most Christians aren't interested in progressive music, but in any event, Neil puts out beautiful, amazing, you know, progressive music with a spiritual theme about Christ. And once again, I'm sorry, I'm looking for his latest, his latest, CD just came out that I have. It's about the life of Joseph and uh, tells the story of Joseph. And it's, and it's beautiful stuff. But here's the thing. I read an interview uh, from a few years ago um, from Neil where uh, a Christian uh, writer was r talking to him about his, his faith. And they said, Neil, I heard you have some different beliefs that's not seemed as orthodox. It has something to do with the Trinity. He doesn't believe in the Trinity, uh, but he says, I'm not a modalist, what I mentioned before, a Jesus only, one that's Pentecostal. But there's something about, believe Jesus is divine, all that, but there's just something about it that's off-centered. And he literally said in the, the article, well, I, I know, you know, that the Nicene Creed says or whatever, but I, I just, you know, think differently or, or whatever. And he's not being a rebel, right? Just, but the point is, Neil, the church for 2,000 years has believed this and have worked very hard to nail this down biblically of what the Trinity is and everything. And you just say, eh, I, don't, I don't quite get it, so I'll do my... Now, I'm still listening to his music. He's still preaching the gospel. But to see, there's something just not right. 
you know, uh, about that. And if we're not careful, if we don't understand, you know, history and doctrine, then we, we get ourselves in trouble as he is. And I'm praying that here come to see and a clear understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. So many Christians and many pastors avoid doctrine, theology. They say, oh, that's the boring stuff. I don't want to get bogged down in that. I don't want to tell my church how to live a successful life, how to have a happy, you know, marriage, how to get my church to get more people here in my, my church. But what does the Apostle Paul tell two young pastors, Timothy and Titus, of what's most important. First, he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 2, to preach the word. The word. Preach the word. That's what, you know, I'm not saying I was perfect. I know I'm not, boy. I fell short. I failed as a pastor. But, you know, preach expositorily. You preach the word and you're going to cover every doctrine. You're going to cover every point. You can still make it relevant, you know, to the people. But preach the word. And that will that will keep you from getting sidetracked. But then he said two other important things. Uh, one other important thing, but to Timothy and Titus. In 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul says to Timothy, watch your life, the way you live, and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. In other words, what you have learned, what has been once and for all entrusted to you, as Jude wrote, meaning the gospel, what has been entrusted to you from Jesus and the apostles, that sound doctrine, he says, preach it, watch your life and doctrine closely. And then in Titus, Titus 2.1, you, however, talking to Titus, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. The verses just prior to it are talking about false, false teachers. And this and this and this and all this wrong, evil stuff. But he says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate, the sound doctrine. That's how important it was. Paul was challenging two young pastors to make sure that they were teaching the word. And in doing so, it would produce sound doctrine. The core fundamental beliefs that Jesus and the apostles taught. And as the disciples went forth, as you're going to see, they did just that. But as you will soon see, it didn't take very long for false teachings to creep into the church. But the Lord raised up brilliant men of biblical faith to study the scriptures and articulate the biblical and orthodox doctrine, dogma is what's essential, that we have today. By studying church history, we see how the devil and or the world and or the flesh of unscrupulous people, or our own unredeemed flesh, try to distort the truth. And the Spirit of God has kept his truth pure. Through studying church history, we can see the errors and understand what the church, uh, what the truth really is. So that when the lies rear their ugly heads, heads again, and they will, we have 2,000 years of men and women of faith defending the faith and keeping it pure. The Arianism of the Jehovah Witnesses, the modalism of the Oneness Pentecostals, also known as the United Pentecostals, the Jesus Only or D.D. Jakes, are not new heresies. They were dealt with and soundly defeated back in the second, third, and fourth centuries. You see, when you know church history, when we know what the early church fathers fought against in the past and how they established orthodox doctrines as proclaimed in, let's say, the Nicene Creed, then we won't be fooled by the so-called new doctrines. Every wind of doctrine that blows in, Paul told us not to be sucked into to that, that these new things that come down the, the pike. Again, there's nothing new under the sun. But sadly, Odd doctrines do creep into the church and the average Christian doesn't see it as heresy because they don't know the word and they don't know their, their history, as I gave you the example of the Jehovah Witnesses. Now, I think what I'll start saying in the, in the next lesson, because I'm basically done now, but maybe I didn't. What I, my, I think my closing thought was, and I'll say it right now, is we live in a world today in the Christian church where we don't confront heresies. We don't say, well, no, we don't want to stir things up. We don't want to offend anybody. And I'm not saying that we, you know, 
protest and burn down their church and things such as, as that. But, you know, people need to be able to speak up when someone's in error. And we do so in love. Speak the truth in love. Okay? So, that's point number five. And when you look at the next video, you're going to see point six. And then point seven, it's just a, a, a fun comment that I, that I make. And then I talk about the, the history of the church, meaning how the church is first depicted, in a sense, in the Old Testament with the call of Abram, God bringing forth the, his own people, and then uh, the birth of the church in, uh, in the New Testament with Peter saying, uh, the gates of Hades will not prevail against my, you know, my church and what ecclesia means and everything. And, uh, and then next week, I'm going to take you chapter by chapter through the first 10 chapters of Acts. Not in great detail, but I'm going to show you how the birth of the church and what was happening. And then we'll look at the lives of the disciples. Okay? So, that's it for now. Please turn the album over and listen to the next teaching. Okay? Thank you. God bless. See you.